This is a mimosa tree in bloom. They're starting to bloom south of our shop and they'll bloom for three or four weeks. Um, they're not a large tree. I think they get maybe 30 feet tall, kind of a bushy tree. They smell really interesting. You have to get close up to smell it. It's not a pervasive perfume that permeates the area. It's just you have to get right up to the flower to smell it, but it's really neat. And it's, the honey is kind of like tulip poplar in that it's very dark, but it has an orange tint to it rather than a red tint like tulip poplar does. And in a good year, a good colony might gain 15 or 20 pounds in our area. There's not that much of it, but there's enough to definitely influence the, the spring honey if you leave your supers on late enough. We definitely do not want this in our sourwood honey because that color really taints our sourwood. Um, as far as it being in our wildflower, we love it because even though it's dark, it has a, a very nice flavor. They're attractive. I wouldn't mind having one in my front yard. A lot of people hate them though because they're so messy. Okay, so we're at the mill yard. You can hear the racket in the background. But I just wanted to show everybody what mimosa honey looks like. It's just starting to come in. These are virgin combs, so the comb is real white. You can see just how dark this honey in is coming in. It's, uh, it's not a super heavy flow, but it is coming in. So everybody that had full supers got another empty to try to, to contain whatever comes in over the next couple of weeks. Uh, we do make a little sourwood in this area, and it usually starts around the 20th of June. Today's the 6th, so we got two weeks to sourwood here. So we'll leave these bees with the supers they got for two weeks, and then we'll come back and strip everything off and give them empty supers. Have you tasted this yet, Selena? Here, taste, taste it. You can see how dark it is on a hive tool. It's pretty dark. Good? It's good. Yeah, I think it's good. I think it's one of the better dark tasting honeys. I like tulip poplar better, but uh, I, uh, as I'm getting famous for saying, I put that on my peanut butter <laughs> sandwich. <laughs> yeah, that's that's mosa. They're bringing in mimosa right now. There we, everybody's got some supers on them now. We're past all that ugly spring honey, and uh, we're making good honey now. Up until this super here, it's been pretty light and pretty tasty stuff, and. I think that mimosa will blend with it nicely when we extract it, it'll all blend together and make a pretty good tasting uh, average color, not too strong, not too mild type of honey. Looking forward to it. Okay, we're right next to Highway 441 in Raven Gap, Georgia. People drive right by here and they never see the bees because they're kind of down below the bridge here. Right beside us is a little creek that is actually the little, the, the very beginnings of the Little Tennessee River. It's just a trickle over there. By the time you get up into North Carolina, it's a regular old river. But uh, anyway, we're pulling honey today and we found something curious, unexpected actually and uh, we've been trying to figure out what we think it is and the only thing that we can see blooming that we think it could be is Chinese chestnut. The elderberries are blooming but I've never seen bees work elderberries in this neighborhood. They might somewhere else, some other state, some other region, but here they don't work them. And what we got going on here is some pretty dark honey I mean, it's dark, really dark. Look at that. And uh, it's about a shade darker than motor oil. I mean, it's dark. Yeah. <laughs> you want to taste this one? You can help me analyze this. It's dark. I'd say it's fair. It's not bad. You like it? Okay. What would you? It's not like molasses, it's nice and smooth. It's really strong though, but it has a good flavor. I think it's Chinese chestnut. 
We usually don't make this type of quantity of Chinese chestnut, but uh, I guess there's a first time for everything. It's about mid, almost mid, we'll see, today's the 10th, real close to the middle of June, and usually this time of year we make very little honey, but this year we're doing okay. I cannot complain. Another one of those yards that we just repopulated this spring is surrounded by these Chinese chestnuts. This area, the Southern Appalachians, used to have a lot of American chestnut trees, and they died to a disease uh, years ago. And I think many people brought in these Chinese chestnuts and planted them to try to offset the loss of the chestnuts. They're not bad eating, and uh, I see most of them around old house sites, and this is an old house site. These bees are sitting right where an old house used to sit. And uh, it's an interesting piece of property. It's surrounded by nice flowers and plantings that you could tell somebody a hundred years ago took the time to and care to try to make a nice property. And of course the house is long gone. We can see remnants of parts of it in, off in the woods and stuff. It definitely was a house here. And this Chinese chestnut tree is about done. It's kind of browning off and we just saw many, many bees in it, but it looks like it's about over. There's a few more around the corner that look like they've got some life in them, maybe seven to 10 days. So uh, we expect to be bringing in a little bit of that Chinese chestnut honey for a while. Uh, decades ago, I was of the opinion that Chinese chestnut honey didn't taste very good. And that was due to an experience I had one day when I tasted dark honey that was coming in and saw the chestnuts in bloom. But the stuff we tasted today really wasn't bad. And the chestnuts are really the only thing I can find in bloom that the bees are working in earnest. So I, I just have to assume that that's what they're bringing in. So we're in northeast Georgia, right, just literally a half a mile from the North Carolina border, western North Carolina. And there's, you got this same sort of stuff in western North Carolina. It's really, you can't tell where the border is. All the terrain is really the same. We're in the southern Blue Ridge Mountains. and. Uh, Things are very green now, very lush. We've had several rains, and, and although it was dry a few weeks ago, it's humid and moist, and I think everything's in really good shape. We're really keeping our fingers crossed for a good sourwood flow. This location is uh, a great sourwood flow. It, the sourwoods are everywhere in these mountains right here. So, okay. This plant is called sumac, and it's right on the verge of blooming. We have two varieties of this type of sumac that we pay attention to. This one blooms just before the sourwood, and it's real good honey, and we like to see it mix with our early summer honey, or maybe you'd call it late spring honey we, that we harvest in June. It's dark, has a good flavor, but we really try to keep it out of our sourwood. And it's one of the reasons that getting good, clear, fairly pure sourwood is tricky because you have to wait till this stuff's finished, take your supers off, then put fresh supers on for sourwood in order not to have darker, stronger sourwood. And then the other variety of sumac like this blooms right after sourwood. It's one of the reasons you only have a two or a three week window for your supers for sourwood if you want to make pretty clean sourwood. And uh, again, it's good honey. We just don't want it in our sourwood because it's kind of like a teaspoon of food coloring in a jar of water. It really changes the color and it will change the flavor too. And sourwood goes for such a premium price when it's fairly pure that we want to keep other varieties of honey out. So we'll be paying real close attention to this one. 